Hello and welcome everybody to this BDA Critical Care Specialist Group webinar um, on COVID-19 and nutritional support in the ICU. My name is Simeon Ramet. I'm the Head of Medical Affairs here at Nutritia in the UK. Um, first of all, I want to extend my thanks to the BDA Critical Care Group. I know many of you have been extremely busy over the past weeks and months in coming up with the guidance. Many of you may have actually seen already, but our speakers today are going to share some of their experiences around that with you today. And indeed, to Liesl and Danny, we know you've been spending a huge amount of time at your trust um, upping the resource and preparing your hospital uh, with everything that it needs. So thank you so much for um, giving up your time today to come and speak and share your experience. We want you to have the opportunity to learn more uh, from our speakers today and importantly give you the opportunity to ask questions that you're not sure about at the end of the webinar. We'll be opening up for questions once we've um, gone through each of the presentations. And from me and Indeed, from everybody at Nutritia, we want to thank all of you and the rest of the staff working to support the NHS and patients. We know it's an extremely challenging time, and it's likely to be this way for the next couple of weeks, and couple of weeks, and indeed couple of months. Um, so we're here at Nutritia to help support you. Um, yeah, and I hope many of you will get a lot out of what our speakers are going to talk about today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Danny Bear who will be your chair as well as your speaker for today. Danny. Wonderful, thank you so much for that introduction, Simeon. Um, and I'd also like to extend um, my welcome to everyone for uh, joining this webinar tonight um, that on nutrition support in the ICU, but with a particular focus on the management of uh, patients with COVID-19. So as Simeon said, my name is Danny Bear and I work at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust as uh, the principal critical care dietitian. Um, I, just a bit of background, um, I was one of the founding members of the British Dietetic Critical Care Specialist, uh, sorry, British Dietetic Association Critical Care Specialist Group, and I'll call that the CCFG going forward. Um, and I've recently rejoined the committee uh, to assist with the increased work that's been required uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm sure that you'll agree that the past few weeks have really been quite a challenge for all of us. And behind the scenes, the CCFG has been really focused and have been working really hard in an attempt to be as responsive as possible to the challenges that we're all facing in managing nutrition in critically ill patients during this particular time. The first step, of course, in managing this challenge was to develop the rapid guidelines. And it was written to reflect the urgent need for planning for increased ICU capacity and dietetic staffing which includes upskilling of non-ICU dietitians and also covers some aspects of feeding these patients that may not be common in non-specialist centres. On the back of this, we've had many requests for information and training, and I'd like to really thank Nutritia for hosting this webinar, which will allow us to disseminate this information more widely. The webinar tonight will consist of two presentations. Firstly, my colleague Liesl will give you an orientation on what you need to consider when you're dealing with COVID-19 patients and what you're likely to see in the coming weeks and months if you haven't started to see it already. And then I will present on the CCSG group guidance. And lastly, if you're not an ICU specialist dietitian, our hosts from Nutritia are going to take you through a very short introduction to some of the feeds that are at your disposal. At the end of these presentations, we'll open the lines and take as many questions as we possibly can. Um, and at this point, I'd like to uh, extend a welcome to our international colleagues who are on the line. And we are really pleased to have you here. Um, and I do hope that we are able to help you out in some of your questions, but please just be aware that we don't necessarily have the knowledge or specifics for anything outside of the UK um, that, practice, that is to do with your potentially um, different practices to us, but we will try and help you out where we can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Lisa Wondrug. Uh, so Lisa is also the Principal Critical Care Dietitian at Guy's and St. Thomas's alongside myself, and is also the Research Officer for the CCSG. Lisa has been at the forefront of planning for our increased ICU bed capacity and increased dietetic staffing and has also been at the forefront of the nutrition management of our patients with COVID-19 in the ICU. And I'm sure you'll find her presentation really helpful. So a very big welcome to Liesl. Thank you very much, Danny. 
uh, and thank you for, uh, to Natricia for the opportunity to speak today. I thought I would start with some of the information that some of you will be aware of from the ICNARC report, the most recent report from the 27th of March. And this has to do with the first 775 patients uh, that were confirmed COVID positive. Um, just some demographic data to set the scene. Um, the mean um, age for these patients was 60 years and the uh, majority of patients were male, nearly uh, yeah, over 70%. Um, of the 775 patients, nearly 400 of these were actually in the London area. Um, and what we might find of interest is the body mass index. Um, if we look at patients with a body mass index over 25, this is actually over 70% of the cohort. Uh, and a body mass index over 30 makes up about 40% of the cohort. So interesting um, comorbidity for us as dietitians to see. If we then look at um, the uh, further demographics in terms of medical history, um, we see that the majority of patients actually were living without assistance um, in terms of their daily activities of living in the community. Um, you can see several severe comorbidities that um, we might expect renal disease, uh, immunocompromise, metast metastatic disease, and nearly 80% of this cohort were, act were mechanically ventilated. So um, I then just wanted to list some of the typical comorbidities that we have seen um, in our uh, patients thus far. Um, definitely patients with diabetes. We've also seen patients with respiratory conditions, so asthma or COPD. Um, also patients with hypertension or uh, cardiovascular disease obesity, um, and often also a combination of the comorbidities. And we've also seen patients admitted um, with immunocompromise. So um, we'd like to then share a little bit of the London experience so far. Um, and I guess by starting to look at what's different from a normal IC, ICU. Now, I know a lot of you are already in the thick of this already, so you will have a clear understanding. But this is more for the rest of us that um, the rest of the people that are probably in the beginning of the planning. Things are looking very different in the ICU. In particular, you will notice that the nursing ratios are changing rapidly. Um, in places where we are used to having a one to one nursing ratio, one nurse to one patient, we rapidly moving towards one to two, one to four, or even in some places, one to six, um, which is obviously very alarming and difficult for, for nurses. Um, we also notice that there are um, teams around doing uh, what they call turning teams, helping with the proning of patients, as this is something that we expect a lot of patients will have to undergo. And um, something else to think about that's very different from a normal ICU setting is that we have various varying levels of experience of our staff on the shop floor, because a lot of them are now surge trained. So we have nurses, doctors, and AHVs that of course come from wards and they may have very little experience in any of the areas they are working in right now. In terms of um, expansion of beds into other areas of the hospital, this is also a very big change. Most ICUs have been asked to expand by four or five fold. Um, and it's not uncommon, I think, for a lot of um, ICUs to expand into several recovery areas, into pediatric ICUs, um, I know HDUs are being upskilled up for, for ICUs, wards are becoming HDUs, and we're also looking at increasing bed capacity within the existing ICUs. Um, but we might also then wonder what happens to patients that might require ICU admissions that are non-COVID patients. Um, in our institution, we're able to keep one of our smaller ICUs uh, a non-COVID unit. And we were able to do this by stopping all um, elective surgery at our trust, and we only have certain amounts of emergency surgery still available. Um, and then another experience which Danny will elaborate on further is the fact that dietitians will be enlisted from all areas to try and support ICU duties. And this, this is really an enormous upskilling effort that, that we've started several weeks ago and Danny can expand on that a bit further. <clears throat> 
If we then look at um, the patients that have presented to ICU um, so far, we've definitely seen patients with severe respiratory failure. And I know we were told initially that the expected ventilation time could be up to 14 days, which we know would increase their nutritional risk. Um, but so far, what we've seen is that the, IC, the length of stay is a little bit shorter. So the ICNARP data suggests a median length of stay of between three and four days. Um, and our local data is also reasonably short. But we do need to note that we're still in at the start of this um, epidemic, and therefore the, the sample sizes would be biased towards shorter lengths of stay. A patient group that we need to look out for that we've seen a lot of recently is type 2 diabetic patients. They may be at higher risk for COVID. And we've also found that they have um, very fluctuating levels of blood glucose and, and difficult insulin management. Um, and therefore, we need to pay close attention to these patients. We probably need to reduce some of the carbohydrate load. And of course, if you consider you may be making changes to your protocol in terms of propofol or citrate and glucose, um, we also need to consider that we need to look at how we can maintain protein targets if we are reducing feeds and changing um, um, carbohydrate content. Some patients um, we have been told from, from other countries present with GI symptoms, um, so diarrhea and vomiting. Um, we haven't seen this so far, but I, I guess if you do, we just need to be cautious, of course, that we need to make sure that these patients um, are looked after thoroughly in terms of GI tolerance. So um, the typical patient then um, requiring nutrition support for us, so far what we've seen, the majority of the patients um, were or are intubated and ventilated and they are in our ICUs. Of course, several have recovered and have been extubated and would be self-ventilating afterwards. Um, we also have some that might be on non-invasive ventilation in our HDU areas. And I think as dietitians, we need to particularly pay attention to this cohort because we know that they may be at risk of really poor nutritional intakes. So the CCSG recommend early placement of an NG tube. Um, and if that is not possible for a patient on NIV, then we would suggest early initiation of oral nutrition support. And we do need to monitor these patients very closely because they're an at-risk cohort. In terms of the age of the typical patients that we've seen, um, well, the ICNOC report suggests a mean age of 60 years. And I, I know the Italian reports have, have also reported 60 to 70 years. But we did want to point out that we do also see younger patients too, and not everyone um, has comorbidity attached um, to, to the emission too. In terms of positioning, we know that proning um, in this cohort will be done more often. It will be something we see more and for longer periods of time, and you may have patients that will be proned on several occasions. And whilst we understand that um, for us working in severe respiratory failure units, this is quite a usual um, um, practice, we understand that this could be a very difficult time for people that are not used to proning. Uh, so we do, the CCSG are working on a new proning protocol and it will be uh, released soon. I think Danny will tell you a bit more about that later. And, but in our CCSG COVID guideline, we recommend that NG feeding should be used um, if there's no GI intolerance. We also recommend that the um, gastric residual volume threshold should be reduced to 300 mils um, and that we should aspirate every four hours to ensure that we reduce aspiration risks. We also would advocate the use of early prokinetics and also the use of concentrated feeds, so 1.3 to 1.5 kilocals per mil. Um, and then if the GI intolerance persists uh, for sort of more, more than two to three days, you could consider um, bedside placement of NJ tubes in institutions, of course, where this is available, or then parenteral nutrition. And I think it's important when we are thinking about proning and stopping the enteral feeds that we also really remind each other and the nursing staff um, that we need to stop the insulin simultaneously so there are no um, incidences of hypos. Then 
In terms of the route of feeding, we have mainly seen uh, nasogastric feeding where we work um, with the occasional use of postpyloric feeding and, and interestingly very few parental nutritions um, that were required at this stage in our trust. And it may just be because we are lowering our threshold a little bit to starting prokinetics earlier and we're definitely waiting a bit longer, perhaps up to three days or more before starting parental nutrition. If we have a look then at um, drug regimens and the impact on nutrition, I don't need to remind you all about propofol. We, uh, we are as dietitians aware that we need to consider the cal calorie contribution of this uh, during our assessments. But we unfortunately we know that propofol will be used more frequently and potentially for longer. And there are issues also with the supply chain of 2% propofol um, and many places are switching to 1%. So we do need to consider the calorie load um, of that during our assessments. Um, in addition to that, we know these patients will require high levels of sedation and neuromuscular blockade, um, which will exacerbate GI intolerance and will be will need to be closely monitored. And as we've mentioned before, in terms of prokinetic use, we know that we'll be using it earlier in view of all the sedation and also proning. In this COVID population, we know that volume restriction may be required um, because that's the similar man management for severe respiratory failure patients and patients with ARDS. And it's therefore prudent to think about considering more concentrated feeds, 1.3 or 1.5 kilocals per mole. Um, but we do know, of course, if you if it's too concentrated, perhaps two kilocals per mole, that it could exacerbate GI intolerance. But if you're in, a, in an institution where you've already chosen your two kilocal per mole feed, that's fine. You just need to think about monitoring um, the GI intolerance a bit more closely. In terms of diuresis and hyponatremia, um, I know we've had several um, questions about that on base camp already. Um, again, you just have to see what, what, what is acceptable in your local practice, but NG water if appropriate, um, but that needs to be balanced with your fluid balance aims for the day, or we would recommend using a feed with a lower sodium content. But it, again, it's really crucial to have the discussions with your ICU team as to what the fluid balance aims are for the day. And at the end of the day, we are going to make several adjustments to regimens due to the drugs or due to the fact that there are several interruptions to feeding in such a sick cohort. So I really can't emphasize enough that we really need to monitor our patients really closely and in particular pay attention to prescription versus delivery of feeding. And this is really to avoid both over and under feeding. So um, I've tried to make a little list of things that I think what we're aiming to do as dietitians. Um, we are, for as long as possible, we want to obviously continue to try and maintain our high ICU dietetic standard of practice. And I know this is going to be very difficult and very easy to say if people are well resourced and the busier we get, this will be much harder to do. But we do have to think about what's best for our patients. We really need to be the advocate for nutrition for our patients for as long as possible and for as much as possible. And we therefore need to ensure in this very busy time that nutrition remains on the agenda for everyone. It's a good idea to have a very robust starter regimen in case patients need to stay on a, on a starter regimen for a bit longer. And um, a really good idea in teams to decide how you would prioritize your patients if you become a bit overloaded with, with the cases. Um, again, we would recommend finding a way to communicate with your ICU team on the shop floor. We know this is difficult. There are several reports of people that have to do remote working without phone access, um, but we do need to think how we can how we can best approach this with new phones, Wi-Fi phones, if there's a video conferencing facility available or anything to make this um, easier and at the bare minimum to try and attend the handovers in the morning so you at least have up-to-date information about the patient. Um, we also need to be very proactive with the management of our pumps, feeds and ancillaries and Danny will speak more on that a bit later. And as we know we will be overwhelmed with cases we need to think where our skills might be best, um, we need to prioritize where our skills might be best used on, on the unit. <clears throat> 
I think it's also time to be very flexible in your approach um, because we know that things change almost <laughs> by the hour in, in our institution, just when you think you've made a plan, it changes. So we really need to be flexible and try and keep up with, um, with, with all the changes. And for that reason, I think it's actually really vital that a member of the dietetic team uh, be a part of the ICU operational management discussions. Um, so you can hear firsthand of the unit expansion and changes that are planned, for example. And we've heard this many times before, but we're in this now and it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. And we really need to think about our team morale because this is going to be a very difficult time for us all. Um, what we're not aiming to do, we are um, not assessing each patient at the bedside. I think that's, that's quite obvious. We won't have the, the capacity to do that, nor might it be safe to do so. Um, I think, again, you need to find out in your um, individual trusts whether remote reviews would be more appropriate to do or whether you can enter the unit. But again, when you do that, you need to um, wear appropriate PPE when you do your reviews. And it's probably a good idea to sort of go onto a unit once and try and do as much as you can rather than enter and exit a number of times. Um, what we don't want is to complicate matters at this time. It's a time to try and simplify our approach. It's not a time to be writing a lot of complicated new protocols and guidelines. Um, and then what we don't know well, there's a lot we don't know. This is new to everyone, so we're all learning together, and I'm sure lots of people will be making mistakes together too. We don't know what the survival rates of the patients are in ICU, um, and we don't know what it might be in specific patient groups that are COVID positive. We also don't know the impact of the virus and ICU stay on the lung function and also the longer term outcomes and nutritional outcomes of these patients. We expect that recovery and rehabilitation will be a major issue further down the line, and this will require input from the whole ICU MDT as a whole. And on a slightly different note, I just wanted to mention um, burnout. I think we know that this is a perfect storm scenario for potential burnout for staff, and it's really important to think about self-care and well-being for ourselves and also for our teams. Do find out where in your trust you can plug into to whatever they have on offer for well-being, whether it's counselling or spaces to debrief um, or just walks in the gardens or free food or whatever that might be, now is the time to look after each other. It then gives me um, great pleasure to um, hand over to Danny for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liesl, for that excellent overview um, of both the medical and, and nutritional aspects of the uh, critically ill patients with COVID-19. I'm sure you'll have lots of questions that come in um, at the end of the session. So I wanted to um, take you through the CCSG guidance uh, on the management of nutrition and dietetic service COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and many of you, I hope, have already uh, looked at these online. Um, and I've got uh, a screenshot of what it looks like when you open up the web page um, and you can see the different tabs where you can flick through uh, all of the subheadings and, and find some hopefully helpful recommendations. So just to give you a bit of background as to how these came about, um, some of you, well, those of you who are members of the CCSG will know that we have an email discussion group and it was becoming very clear that uh, many people had questions about not just planning and preparing for uh, the increased ICU bed capacity of these patients, but also specifics to do with the nutritional management, um, particularly in regards to proning, because it's not something that is common in all centres, as Liesl already mentioned. So as a, a group, we wanted to get together and produce some guidance that would be helpful uh, for everyone across the board. We were also very well aware that, that London centres were probably a step ahead of others in terms of planning for this. And we really wanted to be able to share what we know, um, not just from our own experience, not just from our own experiences, but also what we would kind of gathered from our international colleagues and the publications that were um, or have been um, put out to date from other countries. 
Um, I will just say that um, this guidance is not complete. There are certainly things that uh, we will add to it and it is a fluid document. So please do come back to it, especially if you're someone who has downloaded it as a full document. You might wanna come back every couple of weeks or every week or so um, and just re-look through it and see what has been updated because as we get more information and perhaps more evidence, um, and we discuss with our colleagues, there's certainly going to be some other bits of information that we add. So the first bit of information, uh, and I think the most important uh, element of this document is the discussion and guidance around planning your dietetic services and what to expect uh, with the increased ICU bed capacity. And this is actually the only recommendation that we've made a strong recommendation and that is that planning for increasing ICU dietetic capacity occurs urgently in line with dietetic managers and also critical care planning strategies. So Liesl already mentioned um, the importance of having dietetic representation on the ICU operational meetings. Um, so that we actually have these daily on our ICU and it is the only way that we can keep up to date uh, with exactly what's happening in terms of numbers uh, of new ICU beds and where those new ICU beds are going to be, what's happening with nursing, what's happening with pharmacy, what's happening with physiotherapy. So that allows us to be able to attempt to at least forward plan um, and attempt to be really a step ahead of what's happening, which of course is a little bit difficult when things do uh, change quite frequently. But some of the specific recommendations that we've given for doing this include um, a first step of estimating the number of additional dietitians that may be needed to cover the planned increase in ICU beds. And that is, of course, um, somewhat different. Um, the guidelines for the provision of intensive care services can be helpful because we have guidance for uh, a whole time equivalent um, recommendation for dietitians per bed. But of course, that might be slightly different at the moment because we will mostly be doing remote reviewing. So that will need to be discussed within your local teams, but it can certainly be helpful. Uh, and you can only do that if you have information on what your increase in ICU beds is going to be and um, the phases at which that's going to occur. The next step is to identify dietitians in the department who have previous adult ICU uh, experience or who have significant experience with enteral and parenteral feeding, because these are going to be hopefully your colleagues that you're going to be able to either utilize in the ICU straight away or upskill to be able to work in the ICU. And the way that we've been able to do that is of course, um, again, because Liesl's mentioned that um, elective surgeries have stopped, we've reduced significantly our outpatient clinics. So there are many teams who now have the availability to be redeployed into critical care and we started a, an upskilling and training program for these dietitians a good few weeks ago now. So uh, according to when our new beds were going to be open so that we're always perhaps one step ahead uh, with the number of dietitians that we have uh, trained and available to work with us. And we've accounted for some inevitable sickness and annual leave of course within those numbers as well. The third step is to identify dietitians that have none of the above experience but who will be freed up from, as I said, outpatient services and are willing to help. Um, and I'm sure like us, you'll be incredibly uh, surprised and overwhelmed and incredibly grateful for the number of people who put themselves forward and are just willing to step up and help when it's needed. And, and um, this is probably not the right forum, but if any of our dietitians are listening, um, a huge thank you to you guys because we've just been inundated with people who want to help, which is fantastic. Um, we recommend, as I said, upskilling the proposed ICU dietitians straight away. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the resources that we have available to help you do that, because that can be a really daunting um, job to do and a, a daunting thought. Um, agree some local criteria um, for how patients will be prioritised for dietetic input. And this is particularly important um, for those um, centres where you still may not be able to have enough dietetic services to support all of your your ICU beds. So patients will need to be prioritized. So you need to have a local criteria for that. Um, I think that's incredibly important. And also 
given that a lot of us will be doing remote reviews. You may only have paper notes, not be able to enter the unit as frequently as you would normally like to. So you need some way of, of being able to identify which patients um, may need to be seen first. And of course, lastly, and slightly different to the above points is that many critical care patients will be nursed in non-critical care areas by non-ICU nurses. So this may be in um, theatres recovery or in theatres themselves. Um, and we have found it very useful to make sure that we're communicating with those nursing staff very early about what we might need to implement in those, those units um, to be able to provide the services that we do. So that might be as simple as where does the feed get delivered to? Where do we put the giving sets? And those sorts of things that um, you may not think about because it's normally automatically done, but this is essentially building new intensive care units very quickly. So about every single aspect that goes with that um, is really important. So additionally, uh, what we've done and what we would recommend is phasing the introduction of dietitians into the ICU as per the increase in bed numbers. Um, so you wouldn't need everyone potentially to be there straight away, but you might want to start training people earlier. And secondly, uh, what we've also done is triage the sickest patients to the most experienced dietitian. Um, and the less experienced dietitians would start with the uh, least sick patients um, who are actually still very sick, but less sick than um, potentially a, a ventilated ICU patient. We might uh, triage uh, the high dependency patients to a less experienced dietitian who will still have the skills to be able to manage those patients. So these are some of the things that uh, the London centres have certainly found useful to start with. The second uh, point in our guidance is around feeds, pumps um, and ancillaries. And actually this is becoming, um, well, I would actually say is equally, if not more important than um, a more important aspect of your planning at the moment. Um, and as a, a group, we recommend as a matter of urgency to calculate the number of additional pumps and ancillaries that may be required for you to match your increased ICU bed capacity. Uh, I'm sure that it is well known across the board that uh, feeding pumps are a bit difficult to come by at the moment. Um, and we would suggest that you try and rationalise your pump usage across ICU by not using more than one pump per patient so that at least you uh, might be able to manage some of that increased bed capacity. And I've highlighted this part in particular, and that is to, if you haven't done it already, to contact your enteral feeding pump supplier to determine if they can meet the increased demand. Um, and think about ordering additional ancillaries. What I'm not saying is go and panic buy. Um, that's not going to be helpful for anyone, but you need to be forward planning um, so that as a whole, uh, on a national level, in terms of procurement and supply chain and manufacture, this can be um, managed easily. And actually there is uh, a national group who, who are working on this at the moment. Um, and we hope to have some further information out to you sooner rather than later, but these two points are incredibly important at this point in time. Um, the third point is, of course, if we um, do not have the availability of enough feeding pumps to cope with the increased ICU bed capacity, is that we will need to consider alternative enteral feeding methods, uh, which may include um, bolus feeding. We had initially put gravity feeding in here, um, but actually it doesn't look like there's going to be enough capacity of gravity giving sets to fulfill this. Um, so we think bolus feeding actually might be the next step and the CCSG are working on um, a bolus feeding guideline uh, for ICU patients should this need to be done. We also recommend uh, looking at whether or not there is any availability of community patients or ward patients to be moved to gravity feeding or bolus feeding to free up um, an enteral feeding pump, and also to look into the community to see whether or not there are some patients who may have had a spare feeding pump um, in their homes as a backup, and whether or not we can uh, take that back to be used in the ICU for the moment um, as a matter of urgency. So um, there are a few steps that, that can be dealt with around this particular area. Um, and the fourth point around feeds is, of course, um, already mentioned, the COVID-19 patients are being managed on um, 
quite restricted fluids, um, which is a part of normal management of severe respiratory failure and ARDS, and may require uh, a higher volume of uh, volume restricted or low electrolyte enteral feeds. So just to be thinking about numbers that you may expect to have for those and contacting your enteral feeding supplier um, to make sure that you have a, enough of a supply of those feeds, which you may be using more of in your area. So the next point, uh, which is probably one aspect that we had the most questions on is how do we train non-ICU dietitians quickly to work in the ICU? And this can definitely be a really daunting experience, but we hope that we've been able to provide some assistance in helping you do this. And of course, everyone does it very differently. Um, and we don't specifically have competencies. And as a group, we've recommended that shadowing and, and basic training is commenced for non-ICU dietitians as soon as possible. And we've said basic training because you're not expecting someone who's never worked in the ICU to be an expert. What you want them to do is to be able to do the basics. Um, so we do have a um, a COVID-19 resources page where we've collated a lot of information that we think might be helpful to you and your team. So that might be links to papers or guidelines um, a lot of centres have also very, very kindly um, shared with us um, for your use their feeding protocols, uh, their training presentations, their uh, templates for collecting uh, nutrition information and undertaking, undertaking a nutrition assessment. Um, and you are free to use and adapt those as you wish. I would just ask that if you do just if you're able to acknowledge whoever it is that's written that in the first place, I think that's always a good thing to do. Um, but actually they are there free for you to use. Um, none of those are um, saying that the CCSG approves everything that's in the document. They're really there just um, so that they're able to help you out. Um, and again, similar to the guidance as a whole, this page is updated regularly. So I updated it, I think three times last week when new information comes through. So please do check back there um, as often as you can. And if you have anything that you think might be useful to other people, please do send it on to me and we can very easily get that updated. And at this point, I'd really like to thank Tom, um, the BDA and particularly Tom from the BDA, who's very responsive to uh, updating this page when I ask him. So thank you very much. Um, the next point uh, to discuss here uh, is communication. And again, Liesl's already touched on this. Um, I cannot, emphasize enough how important this aspect is. Uh, and the recommendation from the group is that there is dietetic representation at any COVID-19 operational meetings on the ICU so that you are up to date and can implement any changes uh, in line with um, kind of happening because things do change every day. Uh, so that is really important. Uh, within the guidance, and I haven't listed it here, but I'm sure you have read it or you can read it. We also give um, some suggestions and recommendations that other sites have given us um, on how you might be able to communicate uh, with the teams if you're only able to do remote reviews. So of course, at the moment, we know that um, PPE has been in short supply and, and many dietitians have been asked to not go on to the unit to free up the PPE for um, the, the nurses and the doctors, which makes complete sense. But at the end of the day, we still need to have a way to be able to review these patients. So whether that is phoning the nursing staff on the unit, I know there are some units who use Skype or other video or voice calling applications to be able to communicate with doctors and nurses. Um, some have updated the medical notes to be able to get the information that they need. Um, I would definitely recommend if you can attending the morning handover. We, we do this as a standard and have done for a very long time anyways. Um, and for each of our new ICUs that open, we make sure that we have someone who attends that daily handover because sometimes it, it might be the only point that you're able to get all of the information that you need or, or pass important information back. Uh, so if you go into this um, particular tab on the guidance, you'll, you'll find some uh, help, helpful ideas there. And, and again, if anyone has anything else, then please let us know. The next point in the tabs is on uh, nutrition management, and I'm not going to go through this in uh, immense detail because Liesl's really spoken about it. 
Um, but as you can imagine, we had a really long discussion about what to do about this section because I think what most people would like is specific advice on what to do. But at this stage, um, this is an evidence-free area. So it's very difficult to give particular advice to COVID-19 patients. But what we can do is draw on uh, the evidence and the guidance that we have in managing patients with severe respiratory failure, on ECMO, with AIDS, requiring NIV, um, with high blood sugar levels, those types of patients, uh, and just utilize um, those, that guidance and, and the evidence that we already have. So we haven't been specific. And what we have said is to uh, use, the, use whatever methods you're already using, consider the ESPEN guidelines, and also consider um, the PENG guidelines and very kindly, uh, the PENG group have uh, opened up the critical care chapters of their pocket guide to clinical nutrition for free. Um, and there is a link to those on our resources page. So please do utilize those if you need to. There are also sections within the nutrition management part of the guidelines um, on what we recommend for proning. Um, we are not dictating what you should do. We are giving some guidance on our experiences to date. Um, and our experiences in this patient in the past. And also, you need to think about what your local clinical practice is and have the discussion with your team um, about what would work best, um, particularly with proning patients and the use of concentrated feeds, gas, um, gas residual volume, cutoff levels, um, that all needs some discussion. Um, it's, as Legal said also, it's not really the time to be changing and updating protocols and guidance because it's almost impossible to disseminate that at the moment. And um, so really having a think about out, um, what is the most important thing to do and, and how to get those messages across. Uh, we have a section on monitoring of nutrition support um, and anyone who knows me will know that uh, I think this is one of the most important aspects of our care, particularly looking at prescription versus delivery. And in my opinion, do this, I'm, you're really missing a trick here because it's such an important part of managing our patients. If you don't know what's going in, um, then there really isn't any point almost in you reviewing the patient because you haven't known how much feed they've actually been receiving. So at a minimum, I think that um, we need to try and make sure that we're able to monitor the patient as best we can under the circumstances because I understand that we can't gather all of the information that we, we would want to at this particular time. Um, and this is a really good paper here from Method Berger and the uh, ESPEN group uh, about monitoring nutrition in the ICU. I haven't linked it in the resources page because unfortunately it's not open access, um, but it is a good paper that's available that particularly for non-ICU dietitians gives a really good idea and background of information that should be monitored uh, and rationale for doing that as well. And we've also suggested uh, in the CCSG that uh, dietitians keep up to date with all of the other guidance that is out there, um, which includes guidance around the medical management of critically ill patients with COVID-19, because it's really important for us to understand what's going on medically with these patients so that we can adapt our nutrition management accordingly. Um, and Lisa went through the ICNAR guidelines, so the Intensive Care National Audit and Research Centre guidelines, uh, not guidelines, sorry, um, report. Uh, which is for, at the moment for the first 775 patients that I suspect will be regularly updated. So um, it was, it's a good idea to keep up to date with these sorts of um, reports and guidance that are coming out. We've also linked to the Intensive Care Society uh, COVID-19 hub um, and Intensive Care Society have endorsed our, um, our CCSG guidelines. Um, and this is the website page uh, for them. And they are actually hosting uh, all of the uh, other um, key websites that you might need from different societies. So um, the uh, Royal College of Anesthetists, for example, have some guidance uh, and you can see all of the links here where you can access all of the guidance and information. Um, information on PPE is on there as well. And importantly, um, some really great wellbeing resources that I think we're all going to need to use um, at this particular time. So do try and navigate your way through that guidance. Um, and along with the ICS hub and the ICNARC report um, in the resources page, I have linked um, quite 
a few other uh, websites and resources that will be changed and updated regularly, but I suspect will be really helpful for everyone. So what's missing from the guidance um, and what is potentially coming? So as I mentioned, it's a fluid guideline and we will be updating it uh, as new information comes in. We don't have a section on post-ICU nutrition and recovery yet. And we didn't do that because we really wanted to focus on getting the information out there for the acute patient. Um, and that's what our initial focus was. But I know that, you know, the post-ICU nutrition and recovery piece is very important. And actually, if anything, the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the importance of recovery and rehabilitation post-ICU, um, which can only be a good thing. Uh, so we will add a section on the CCSG have been working very hard on um, a proning protocol that people can adapt. There is also already some um, examples on the resources page, but we will have a CCSG specific one and also a CCSG specific bolus feeding protocol to help out those sites who um, are going to potentially need to use bolus feeding in the ICU patients. So please do check back and um, Whenever you get an opportunity, I would say at least once a week, but maybe a couple of times a week, um, if you're a bit lost with, uh, um, you know, some information and do feedback to us if you have anything that you think will be useful. Um, so I hope that's been a good overview and given you an idea of um, why we came to some of the decisions that we came to. And I will stop there um, and obviously be able to take your questions um, afterwards. But I would like to now hand over to Sean, who is from um, Nutrition, um, and he has uh, will give you an update on some of the feeds, enteral feeds that they have available within their uh, portfolio that might help during this time. So thank you to Sean. Hi there. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, my name is Sean. I work as a medical affairs advisor at uh, Nutrition. And firstly, I'd like to say a huge thanks to Danny and Liesl for presenting the webinar this evening and to those in the BDA critical care group who contributed to producing this guideline at such short notice. It's truly remarkable. Uh, I'll now be providing a short overview of the Nutrizon specialised tube feed range and the support services we have available to you at the moment. So firstly, I'll start with a Nutrizon Protein Intense. So Nutrizon Protein Intense is a 1.26 cal per mil high protein tube feed for the dietary management of disease related malnutrition in critically ill patients. It is the first and only whole protein tube feed that fully meets international critical care guidelines and it contains 10 grams of protein per 100 mil. Next, we have Nutrizon Advanced Protozon a 1.28 cal per mil high protein enteral tube feed designed to support the nutritional needs of patients during the post ITU phase. It contains 7.5 grams of protein per 100 mil. Finally, we have our three high protein feeds designed to support the nutritional needs of patients on the ward or in the community. Firstly, we have Nutrizon Protein Plus, a 1.26 cal per mil feed which contains 6.3 grams of protein per 100 mil. And then we have the version with fiber, Nutrizon Protein Plus Multifiber. And then the newest addition to the high protein range, we have Nutrizon Protein Plus Energy, a 1.5 cal per mil feed, high in protein, that, um, and it has 7.5 grams of protein per 100 mil. On the next slide then, we have our two feeds which may be suitable for those with uh, renal impairment or fluid restrictions. Firstly, we have Nutrison Concentrated, our feeds uh, that contains two calories per mil, and our unique feed, Nutrison Low Sodium. For those patients with GI disturbance, we have the peptide-based feed, feed, which you may want to consider, Nutrison Peptazorb. And then finally, I'd like to highlight the additional support services that we have available. So firstly, we have the Nutrition Resource Centre, which is a dietetic-led service providing advice to healthcare professionals. And the contact details are now on the screen if you need them. 
Next, we have nutritiahcp.com, which gives you full access to resources and services that can support you in your daily practice. If you visit the Resource Center tab for information, you will find that we have a section on COVID-19. And in this section of the website, you'll be able to find advice and guidance on alternative methods of feeding, such as gravity and bolus. And then finally, we have our Nutrition Dietetic app, which is free to download and contains the Nutrition Compendium. There's also a section to calculate nutritional requirements, and there is an RNI comparison there. Now I'd like to hand back to Danny and Liesel, who will be going through the Q&A with you. So now that you can see us, um, just to introduce myself again, I'm Danny, um, and you can see Liesel uh, on the other picture in her scrubs. Um, thanks for listening and, and joining in again. I am going to jump straight into the questions, um, of which there are quite a few. So please excuse me looking down uh, at the desk in front of me because I do have your questions coming through on the phone um, and we'll get through as many as we can in the next kind of 15, 20 minutes. And whatever we don't get through, uh, we will put on the uh, Nutrition HCP website as a Q&A. So we won't have forgotten about them. We will definitely try and answer them. So I'm going to get started with the first question, uh, which is um, someone's asked, which energy and protein requirements are you using for obese and non-obese patients? So again, uh, in the uh, CCSG guidance, we have really steered away from giving specific uh, equations to use for any requirements for any of the patients because specific to COVID, there really isn't any evidence. So we recommend whatever you would normally do in practice, whether that's using a weight-based equation or the Penn State equation uh, for energy, um, and also the same for protein. So I would always suggest um, in any patient to use a minimum of 1.2 grams per kilo of body weight per day. Um, but of course, you might want to use more uh, in renal replacement therapy and, and in your obese patients. So um, yeah, I would say just use whatever you would use in your standard practice um, and don't try and change things too much. Uh, so the second question that's come in is, um, how have you successfully advised on additional fluid with the limitations on pumps? For example, have you used boluses of water or two pack connectors? Um, and I'm going to ask Liesl to take that question if that's all right. Yes, happy to. Um, so you can use two pack connectors. We have tried these um, and you can run your feed and your water um, through those. The only caveat from that is the feed and the water have to be at the, running at the same rate. Um, there are other pumps that would allow uh, one to run feed and water at different rates, so you can look into those. You can also bolus uh, fluid into patients that are tolerating their feeds. I would suggest not to bolus in anyone that's in the prone position. And I think whilst we're just speaking about the fluid, I just wanted to raise the, um, the fluid balance issues again. I think it's really important that we discuss this, as I've said earlier in the, in the slide section. Uh, discuss this with our ICU consultants because what we are finding in practice is although we initially spoke about having lots of fluid restrictions for these patients and perhaps running a negative one litre um, balance, we know that the patients are often really pyrexial and they may remain pyrexial for a number of days and of course the losses, fluid losses will be vast. So I know in discussion with a lot of our consultants we've decided we may run a zero balance rather than a negative one litre fluid balance. Great, thanks okay. Liesl. Um, the next question is um, more a kind of capacity question. So it's it's how many patients um, per dietitian are you using daily and what is your ICU bed capacity at present? Um, so I think that's related to um, a ratio of dietitians to patients. So um, what I say here, I realize is not going to be the same as everywhere. Um, so as we've mentioned earlier uh, from the guidance, we have really tried to upskill a lot of non-ICU dietitians to work in ICU. And we've been able to do that because of the reduction in outpatient clinics uh, and surgery. So we are at the moment aiming for one dietitian per 15 patients. Um, and we've included in that a 20% sickness because unfortunately it's likely that um, many of us are going to be going off sick. Um, and we have chosen to uh, do that 
now to upskill dietitians now and make sure that we have more dietitians upskilled um, and able to work in intensive care earlier rather than later because we realize that as things get busier and busier it's harder to train people and also with people going off sick it might be more difficult so this may not actually continue to be our ratio but that's what we're we're trying to work for at the moment um, but of course you know sometimes people still have phone calls to do for their community patients or home enteral feeding patients or you know there might be uh, need, needing to help their colleagues on the ward so we are flexible back and forth uh, as we need to at the moment um, but that's what we're aiming for um, in terms of ICU bed capacity we're in the hundreds at the moment um, of the number of ICU beds that we have um, so that's that question uh, the next one um, yeah is a really good one actually I'm going to pass this one to you Liesl um, so it is are you allowed on the ICU unit or are you using indirect reviews or virtual meeting packages such as Zoom um, and how are you measuring efficacy? So I will start by saying initially we decided we opted to work remotely and that was mainly um, to save the precious PPE for nursing staff and doctors. Uh, although recently we've been informed, um, obviously the stock and supply in our trust is very good, so we are able to go on to units. So with appropriate training for PPE and the donning and doffing, we are now able to go onto the units and review patients. Um, we do have a system in place for that. So obviously um, you can't take paper and things inside. So what we do is we have tried to encourage our teams to go, go in perhaps once, not on multiple occasions, get the data you need and we phone a buddy in the department and we can relay the information to them. Um, although we understand for most people you'll be working remotely, we know that we are in a fortunate position in our trust to have um, CareView or an online system for our all our ICU notes, which makes remote working really easy, of course. Um, <clears throat> but you just, you, you know, we need to try and find the best way to communicate. So our trust is also looking at um, various IT solutions and it may be Zoom or a different platform because what we, even if we are working remotely, what we would like to do is to be able to actually see our patient, to visualize them, to help us with the classification of their body mass index and so forth. Um, but we, we don't have a solution for that yet. We're looking into that. And as to the, the measure of efficacy, I don't know yet. We'll, we'll be able to tell you. Great, thanks, Liesl. Um, I'm going to give the next question to you too, actually. So there's sure. actually been a lot of questions coming through about uh, step down and how to manage the recovery of, of uh, these COVID patients. So we'll try and answer a few of those. Um, but the first one is, um, what has been the nutritional status of your step down patients from ICU? I think it's a bit early to tell um, what the nutritional status is specifically but we know we would expect uh, muscle waste sitting especially in the patients that have been long stay and those with a multi-organ failure um, i think there'll probably be other questions relating to that but we we also know that we do need to follow up very closely in terms of their their feeding um enteral feeding or ons support yeah and I, I will just add to that and and we'll get to some more of these questions in details but actually um, one of the very few positive things that have come out of this COVID-19 pandemic is that actually um, post-ICU recovery and rehabilitation is really on the agenda now, and it never really has been before for anyone who's not in ICU. Um, and I'm just really happy that, you know, we've got community dietitians and ward dietitians yeah. who are interested in the nutritional status and, and feeding of patients post ICU. So I'm hoping that this is going to kind of start that being something that is um, usual care for us, because, you know, even unless you work in ICU, it doesn't really kind of happen. So I'm, I'm really pleased about that. Um, okay, lots of questions coming through about proning as well. Uh, so Lisa, I'm going to send this one to you as well. Yep. Um, so this is, I'm interested to hear strategies for feeding prone patients. Is PN a safer strategy than jejunal feeding, given the practical risks involved with scoping COVID-19 positive patients? Thank you. Um, I wouldn't say it's a safer strategy. For us, it just depends on what you have available in your institution. So we would always start in prone patients with NG feeding, and usually this is well tolerated. Um, um, and of course, if the NG feeding isn't well tolerated, we would start with prokinetic use in the first instance. And, uh, and you've seen the um, information we've put on the website from the CCSG guidelines for that. 
Um, so we would advise that you use 300 more cutoffs and check the gastric residual volumes more frequently every four hours. Um, I guess we would probably start prokinetics a bit earlier in this cohort, not necessarily prophylactically, but just starting it earlier. Um, if you have bedside capacity to place post pyloric feeding tubes, that would be the next step. But we understand this won't be feasible for a lot of people. So if that doesn't work or you don't have the capacity to do that, then parental nutrition would be fine. But it's not necessarily safer. It's just what you have available in your institution. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I might answer the next one, um, which is a, a really good and probably quite timely question for many of us, um, which is how many giving sets per day are you advising using on a daily basis? Um, and I think this is a really, really good question because um, a lot of the stock issues we're finding may have implications for infection control. So um, we obviously advise one giving set per patient per day, which is the kind of standard practice. So one giving set per 24 hours. Um, but I know there have been reports of some units who are using one giving set for longer than 24 hours. So over a, a longer period of time. Um, and of course, that might have issues with, you know, degradation of the tube and, and feed blockages. And it's, it's not particularly great for infection control. What we have found um, is because there are more and more patients coming through and making uh, potentially larger intensive care units, stock levels are potentially an issue. And one of the reasons that nurses may be doing that and, and using giving sets over more than 24 hours is because we have an awkward organized for additional stock to be delivered to those ICUs. So I think that really comes in in the planning aspect of it is to think about how much stock you're going to need and um, how frequently that should be um, uh, replenished. And we are at the moment um, trying to replenish those sorts of stocks twice a day, not we personally as dietitians, but the people who replenish the stock twice a day so that we don't run into that um, as an issue because technically the stock itself should be there. It's just getting it to where it needs to be. So I think that's really important that we try not to, um, uh, to use the giving sets for more than 24 hours and to just use one per day. Um, next question, Liesl, I'm going to ask you, um, which is what types of feed are most appropriate in COVID-19 patients and what is your first line feed? So obviously, because this is a new patient cohort, it's not that we don't know which is the most appropriate, but I think um, in any trust, keeping your available stock to a minimum is always good. So you don't want to confuse staff by having a lot of new feeds. Um, I will speak through what we have um, and what we have in stock. So our standard uh, feed is actually a high protein feed, 1.25 kilocal per mole and 6.3 grams of protein per hundred mole. And that's our standard feed that we use on our starter protocol. Um, we would also have a more concentrated feed available for if we need for, for fluid restrictions, 1.5 kilocal per mole. Um, and we also have low sodium um, feeds up, uh, available. Thank you, Liesl. Um, and do you have a preference for which one you would use? Depends, <laughs> depends on the scenario. So I yeah. would like to, um, obviously, with the starter, starting patients, I would use just our starter regimen. If there's anyone that needs a higher protein target, so in other words, obese or on renal replacement therapy, I would use an even slightly higher protein uh, feed. Um, and then in discussions with the consultant, um, if we look at fluid fluid balance, if we do need to restrict or if a patient is prone, we would move towards the more concentrated feeds. Um, and if we need to look at actually restricting the, the sodium going in, then there are options available for that too. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take the next question, um, which actually comes from um, a care home dietitian. So I'm actually really happy about this, back to my previous point. Um, and the question is, do we have any figures on recovering COVID patients as to how many um, as a percentage are likely to return to care home or community settings requiring enteral nutrition being affected with dysphagia and needing prescribed oral nutrition support? Um, and this is a really good question. Mm -hmm. Um, that has three facets to it, really. Um, the, the first uh, and most honest answer is we actually don't know because we're really at the more acute stage of uh, treating patients with COVID-19 at the moment. So it's really difficult to predict what we might see. Um, and of course, you know, in our standard ICU patients, 
there are certainly a percentage of patients who will need enteral feeding when they step down to the ward, but maybe quite a few less who would require enteral feeding when they go into the community. However, um, I would expect there to be probably a significant number who would require oral nutrition support and dietetic follow-up in the community. So I think that would, I am predicting, is still going to be um, the case, but I, I can't say for sure because we haven't really got to that point yet. But um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be adding a post-ICU and, and recovery element to the CCSG guidance. So if you come back to that um, in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping that we will have an update regarding that. And also there's a national group who are looking at um, recovery and, and rehabilitation in COVID-19 patients, which I think is going to be really important. Um, and just to comment on the number of patients that might be affected with dysphagia, Again, difficult to say in this particular cohort, but it is post-ICU uh, dysphagia really is quite a problem. They get a, potentially a lot of laryngeal injury, especially the longer intubated they are. Um, so I would imagine normally that's around 30%. So speech and language therapists are going to have an incredible role um, at the moment because there'll be more and more patients coming through to assess. So again, I can't tell you numbers specifically for COVID-19, but it is something that needs to be on everyone's radar, um, especially on the wards and, and um, in the community as well. So thanks for that great question. Um, okay, the next one, Liesl, I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm which is, uh, it's quite a long question. So okay. it says, with data showing um, those requiring ICU beds, 72% have a BMI over 25, and many are independent pre-admission requiring critical care beds. Do we think that patients might recover more quickly than our usual ICU cohort, or can we not know this at the moment? So I guess because if we're thinking they are independent prior to ICU, yeah. does that mean that they're less, less at risk? It's a good question. We we just don't know. Um, but I, I wouldn't say they're less at risk. Um, I think we saw at the beginning of this of this COVID phase, we don't really quite know what we're facing yet. Um, I know we are expecting long ventilation days, long ICU days. The data hasn't particularly shown that yet if we look at ICNAP reports. Um, but we can certainly prepare for the fact that these are patients that potentially will have multi-organ failure, lots of insults. Um, we have certainly, when I've looked at um, after our patients, we have patients that are um, hyperinflammatory. We've got CRPs well up to 600s and actually levels of inflammation we're actually just not used to seeing. Um, and hyperperexia, as I've mentioned, and this could carry on for several days. So I think actually all of those factors combined um, could tell us that it will take a long time to, to recover. Great, thank you. Uh, and I guess this goes back also to us, um, you know, a lot of the very sick patients that are very young often, um, we think that maybe they won't be at risk and also similar to overweight and obese patients, sometimes people will think, well, that's fine, they don't need to be fed. But I think this, this they probably do because they're so incredibly unwell when they're in the ICU that actually I think they still need to be, um, we may need to make sure that we are feeding them correctly and, and monitoring their recovery. So. Um, okay, next question for Lisa. I'm going to give this one to okay. you as well. Sure. Another clinical question. So um, it says, interested in your thoughts regarding CPAP patients and nutrition before coming to ICU. Um, if oral nutrition is not meeting needs, would you do NG or PN? So, yeah, that's a very good question because I think these patients are really at risk. Um, I wouldn't Go, I wouldn't run to PN in the first instance, actually, if, if oral feeding is, is not working or you, you can't get it in or oral nutrition support is not working, then nasogastric feeding would definitely be recommended. Um, but we would recommend that you actually get the nasogastric feeding established quickly, as quickly as possible, um, because these patients we know are at risk of not taking in enough um, orally. Great. So we would need to monitor them. Um, I will make one addition to that as well. And in that, um, a lot of the thoughts at the moment are that maybe uh, CPAP should be used um, for a very short amount of time before the patients are intubated. So it would be worth having that discussion with your team to find out what your practice is going to be. And, and certainly if the patient's going to be on CPAP for a few days, um, then definitely consider that, but also consider the risks of starting feed um, if the patient is going to be intubated kind of imminently. So um, just another additional thought, but totally agree with everything you said, obviously. 
Um, so the next question I will just answer very briefly. And I, this might have been a question that came through um, as you were speaking and before I did my session, um, which is, do you have a protocol for feeding in ICU for the COVID-19 patients? So we haven't made a specific protocol for COVID-19 patients. We are using our usual feeding protocol, um, but certainly some ICUs have a specific COVID-19 feeding protocol because they know that they're not able to access the patients or the medical notes as quickly as they normally would. Um, and there are some examples of these on the resources page of the guidelines. So please have a look on there to have a look, um, check out some of those guide guidelines. Um, okay, Liesl, next question for you. Uh, it's another proning question. So the question is, how long are patients being proned, kept in the prone position and are enteral feeds continuing whilst in prone position? So yes, thank you for that question. We we are finding that people patients are prone more often and for longer, um, so up to sort of sixteen hours a day, and then just two point four eight hours, um, and and again in the same patient they may just be two point four eight and then prone again. So for several days in a row they may be prone, um, and this is obviously a, a little bit more unusual to what we all are used to, um, and we are feeding people in the prone position and that feeding is ongoing and to be fair mostly in our case we do this via nasogastric feeding. Thank you. Um, I wanted to there's a lot of questions still coming through and we've probably got about three minutes left. Um, this is a really important question and Liesl I do want to ask you this one as well and, I, and I'll chip in if I have anything else to add but the question is as the number of patients increases is there still capacity for daily reviewing of patients on feeds? Mm. So we are trying our best to do that. Um, I know some places won't be as well resourced and I understand that. Um, the key really is to make sure your patient's obviously on a good starter protocol and then to prioritize. Um, you have to have a system in place where you can identify which patients need to be seen. For example, obviously refeeding patients or anyone on parenteral nutrition or patients that are severe, severely malnourished or anyone with GI intolerances. Um, so we would aim to do that and we do review our patients as required. Um, obviously, if it's a, someone we know and is well established, we probably will review them as a minimum once per week. Um, but we, we, we can't do this and you can't troubleshoot or prioritize without attending your, your handovers in the morning. I find that's probably the mm -hmm. most business, the, the most important business part of your day. It allows you to understand what, what's happened to the patient overnight. And it also al allows you that little bit of time with a consultant or the nurse in charge or junior staff just to raise some issues, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're doing some remote working. Yeah, that's really important. And I, and I will just touch on the um, part of that question that said daily reviews. I don't think that there is really many patients who would ever require a daily review from a dietitian um, on the ICU in standard practice. So, you know, I'd really consider how often you review your patients and what is the most efficient way to do that, really. Um, so that's good. OK, I think we'll take one more question. And if it's OK, I might take this one, yeah, Liesl, sure. if you don't mind. So the question is, and I think this is a really, really important one. Um, please advise if and when you may consider bolus feeding um, in ICU patients with COVID. Um, OK, so this is really difficult um, and I struggle with this one a lot. So um, obviously there is an issue with uh, feeding pumps potentially at the moment um, or being able to get hold of feeding pumps when you need them. So there is a discussion around whether or not the patient should be bolus fed instead of being continuously fed. Um, we did a study, some of you may have seen it, was just we pushed it through in publication recently. We, we looked at uh, intermittent feeding or bolus feeding, so six boluses through the day versus continuous feeding and the effect on muscle wasting in non-COVID patients, this was done a while ago. Um, so a kind of sick, but kind of general ICU patient. And we didn't find any issues with safety in terms of gas residual volumes or um, blood sugar control, but none of those patients were prone and none of them had super high insulin requirements like we're seeing in the COVID-19 patients. Um, and none of them, uh, and we were able to, to tra transfer them back onto continuous feeding if we did see problems with gas residual volumes. So I personally feel very uncomfortable with bolus feeding a COVID patient who is going to be prone um, and who does have very high insulin requirements. So I would think very carefully about that. Um, 
I realize there are going to be situations where we possibly can't do it, but I think this is where, where my plea earlier to try and find as many feeding pumps as you can comes into play and to think about how you would prioritize the feeding pumps for the sickest patients. And if you have some more stable patients, then potentially they can be bolus fed. Um, and this really, if there are, obviously this is uh, hosted by Nutrition, this website, but if anyone else from industry is listening, it is obviously really important that we do source these feeding pumps um, to be able to safely feed the patients. So um, that's just obviously uh, my thoughts on that one. So I think given the time, um, I'm going to uh, close off for tonight. Um, I hope that you found it really useful. Thanks so much, Liesl, for being here so late, especially when you've got a little one at home. Um, to Sean for giving us an update uh, and to all of you for logging in and, and uh, spending the time with us this evening. Uh, we will do an FAQ of, of the rest of the questions. Um, there were quite a few that came through, lots of very similar themes, so proning and, and uh, step down of patients. Just a reminder to come back to the guidelines whenever you can, um, and we will try and update those as quickly as possible. Um, there are only so many of us on the committee, so if anyone would like to specifically help us out, we would be very happy with that. Um, and lastly, to say, um, obviously, as dietitians, I think you're all amazing. Um, and look after yourselves and look after each other, and um, please get in touch if you need anything. Um, so thank you very much, and have a lovely evening. Thank you.